Thank you very much, everybody, for being um, with us today at this uh, workshop um, that will tackle um, a very important issue around cybersecurity and particularly uh, collaborative risk-based uh, framework of regional and national cybersecurity initiatives. Uh, my name is Claudia Selli. I work for at and I'm based in uh, Brussels, um, where I lead the uh, engagement for at and uh, there and also at the IGF. Um, so, you know, when um, the idea of, of this workshop is really government are really struggling around um, cybersecurity now that more and more objects are connected to the Internet, I think it's really a key issue to... Uh, to discuss um, in order to create um, uh, an, a trusted environment uh, also for people uh, to be able and uh, use the devices that are connected to, uh, to the internet. I have um, with me here uh, a great lineup of uh, speakers, so I'm really honored to be on that uh, panel and have the opportunity to moderate them. And uh, the main, um, let's say that the panel will mainly focus on two, um, on two aspects. From one side, the challenges in capacity building and development of national cybersecurity framework. And the second one is efforts to foster international and regional collaboration in cybersecurity. So I will leave the floor to the speakers, um, five minutes each for introductory remarks, and then we'll open up um, to the audience as well, because I think it's very interesting to have uh, a discussion with you. Uh, so I would really welcome your questions. And uh, with that, I'm going to start with uh, Bill Dutton from the GCSCC. Uh, uh, the floor is yours for to start. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we had a conference in February 2018 where we, uh, at the GCSCC uh, at Oxford, we brought people in not to focus on the findings of our work, but to uh, actually have people come in and talk about findings ar around the world from our collaborators. So we were gathering together observations about cybersecurity, and we had a, a, a full conference over a full day, and I'm going to summarize it in five minutes, and uh, try to give you some of the key themes that I thought were most interesting and, and maybe provocative for the panel. One was the uh, concept of uh, cybersecurity being a wicked problem. And uh, I think that's really, that was a really nice way of putting it, and we captured that in a report, and it would be available. But the, the idea being that there's so many actors, so many potential risks, so, and uh, technologic, so many technologies involved, and that these are all changing as we speak, so that, that dealing with this problem is, is wicked in the sense that it's, it's it's very difficult to resolve, and, and people have moved away from saying that we're going to resolve it, and we're going to have cybersecurity, it's going to be resilience to cybersecurity and, and capacity to deal with cybersecurity on an ongoing basis. So this wicked problem notion is very useful, and as the chair said, there were, t uh, there were two sort of central themes. One was around the response to building national cybersecurity capacity, the other was uh, thinking much more regionally and globally. And I, I will uh, 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 briefly give you some sense of, of, of what we meant by those, in those two categories. With respect to uh, national cybersecurity capacity building, one of the interesting things was people were saying that cybersecurity is now not a, they don't have to sell cybersecurity as much. Everybody recognizes cybersecurity as a big issue. This is a big turning point in the, there in the sense that at all levels, local, regional, and, and across government and business, cybersecurity is recognized as a central problem. Uh, the other was there was some consensus on uh, the, the central steps, early steps in developing uh, capacity, and, and those tended to center around um, developing a strategy and also uh, working on the development of, of a national computer security incident response, a CERT, that, uh, and these the development of CERTs and, a and strategy seem to be uh, one of the most uh, emphasized aspects of um, capacity building at the national level. Another interesting theme to me in, uh, in this area was uh, people mentioned cybercrime has had 
uh, one reason why uh, cybersecurity is, is, is agreed as a, as a uh, high priority is, is uh, and especially in, uh, in emerging economies as well as developed economies, is this rise of cybercrime and that it has focused people's attention on, the, on the, the priority that has to be given to cybersecurity capacity. And also, it has um, uh, become an imp impetus and, an, and one of the best examples of collaboration uh, across governments and across uh, uh, sectors uh, in, in nations. So this uh, sharing of data, sharing of information, uh, coordination of, 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 of police and so forth. So that in the cyber crime area, there seems to be a, a leading edge in terms of uh, developing capacity for uh, collaboration across jurisdictions, for example, um, and in data sharing. Uh, the other was uh, there's certainly this uh, widespread uh, recognition that the, the a technical focus on cybersecurity is misplaced unless people focus also on the cultural and societal aspects of cybersecurity. Things like developing norms, of, of uh, not just in terms of uh, major uh, uh, cyber attacks and, and what, what norms should be guiding this, but ev even among users and ha how do we develop norms as an, and uh, cultural um, mindsets to that prioritize cybersecurity so that people uh, are just consciously con thinking about cybersecurity in their everyday information practices. And the other was the importance of uh, getting indicators of capability. And um, uh, this is one of the things we do at the GCSC is, is, the, um, is develop indicators of capability, but uh, there was a, a fairly good consensus that these, some indicators like this are ver valuable in all countries because they show uh, uh, there, there are methods of, of indicating progress, they're, they're, uh, they're important for showing and demonstrating impact and so forth. But then the second theme was much more, uh, I found it was, there seemed to be a shift from simply developing national cybersecurity capacity to thinking more regionally and globally. And it was almost like we think we know how to do the national capacity building and people are on, in progress on that but we're, we're less um, adept at doing regional and global collaboration. And, and the way it came about is uh, the way I recorded it was uh, a sort of a twist which was acting r regionally and globally uh, in order to address, uh, in order to affect local problems. So acting globally uh, to be, uh, uh, and regionally to help locally. And there, there seemed to be this sense that, uh, uh, and there were some great examples of, of collaboration in um, East Asia and, uh, and other parts of the world in which there were regional efforts um, that really were affecting uh, local, local uh, issues, such as uh, training programs, uh, international uh, support for the, co the costs of cyber capacity building, and simply discussing this regionally um, and making this a priority of foreign policy uh, at, at the regional and, national and global level. Uh, but I'll stop there and I hopefully one or, one or more of these themes uh, will be picked up by others and, and we can uh, build on that in the discussion. I hope I see. Thank you. Thank you um, uh, very, very much also for staying on time, uh, Bill. I will now uh, leave the floor to uh, Greg Shannon, who is the chief uh, scientist for the CERT uh, division at the Carnegie Mellon University Software uh, Engineering Institute. Um, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Um, glad to be here to talk to you this morning here. I'm on, here on behalf of IEEE. Uh, as well as Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, in my day job, I'm the chief scientist for uh, what was the first search for incident response capability uh, and that we are now helping uh, promulgate throughout the world with the help of the U.S. government 
in terms of building regional and national capacity throughout the world. This is work that's been going on for uh, over three decades now. Um, what I want to highlight today are uh, what I see, this is my fourth uh, IGF, and I see uh, you know, a clash of cultures in how we think about capacity and how we think about cybersecurity. Uh, on the one hand, we see the UN perspective of uh, a, a nation-led um, multi, multi, multilateral approach. On the other hand, we have the internet built up in a multi-stakeholder approach. Uh, if you want to look for a model of regional and uh, international collaboration, you need to look no further than the IETF, the, Net Engineering, uh, the Internet Engineering Task Force where they meet thrice, three times a year and figure out how to engineer the internet. Uh, since the internet is always on the verge of breaking down because it continues to grow, uh, they always have a, a very full docket. Um, and if you look at what really makes uh, incident response work uh, effective in this area, uh, what it comes down to is uh, understanding and respecting the agency, the uh, ability of engineers in the field to make decisions and respond. And I think this is a key point that highlights the kind of the difference in cultures. Who has agency to make decisions? Is it only the government or is it actually people in the field who are putting their hands on the keyboard, on the cables, and helping to keep connectivity there, helping to respond to security incidents, understand what the attacks are, are doing the forensics, are working with law enforcement? They have the agency. And that's, so it's, there's really two models here. One is that uh, re respects and encourages that distributed agency and teaches that distributed agency model to our, uh, and from a capacity building point of view. And the alternative is one that says, no, there are a set of rules that you must follow. And that is how your job is described. And we understand the job that you need to do and you do that job uh, only. And you have, you have limited, uh, limited agency. Now, of course, if you give someone agency, it's always in the, the context of a, um, uh, it's grounded in a moral and a cultural and an ethical context. Uh, you know, when you have agency, moral agency in particular, you want people, you need to have people trust you. So you have to have some sense of accountability, whether it's your reputation, which is traditionally how uh, the internet has worked, where your reputation as a technical responder to cybersecurity incidents is, uh, you know, based on your performance with your peers. There's not necessarily a law there. And your competency. So these two, these two uh, alternatives provide, um, if you have a distributed agency, then you can have, uh, that's expansive, then you have agility. And you allow people to do experimentation. You know, we've never run an internet before on a global scale. So anyone who pretends to say they know what the solution is, is really uh, not being honest about how things are operating and the degree to which experimentation is important. With this agility and experimentation, we get innovation and resilience. And many governments, of course, want innovation. Many citizens want a resilient infrastructure. If we take an restricted approach to agency, uh, then we end up with stovepipes and bureaucracy. When two groups need to be able to interact, instead of trusting the, uh, the uh, the, the members to uh, uh, make good choices, uh, that there has to be a strict protocol, you end up with a bureaucratic approach. This leads to stagnation and brittleness. And that brittleness is exactly what adversaries want to exploit. They would love to destabilize a brittle, it's much more easier to destabilize a brittle uh, internet than it is an internet that has a resilience built into it through a distributed agency model. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind as we try and build global capacity uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, um, Greg. I will now move to uh, David uh, Van Turen from the GFC. -E. Sorry, if you wanted to... Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, in the next five minutes, I would like to... to um, to, to describe how, what the GFC is and how we are, how, how we are developing. Um, the GFC is a neutral, informal platform with private organizations, with governments, countries, and also um, with international organizations. 
It was launched in 2015, and at that time, um, there were several organizations, countries who are in cyber capacity building, uh, but there was a need um, to bring that together, to create a platform that could bring these parties together to be more efficient, to be able to find each other, to be able to reduce overlap. So, so the goal of the GFC uh, in 2015, when it was created, was to strengthen international cooperation and coordination on cyber capacity building. And um, in that promise, we started where a lot of organizations are starting, or platforms, uh, with awareness raising. So if I look at the GFC and the developments and the steps we've taken, I see uh, a process from awareness to implementation and try together within this platform, try, try to create an ecosystem for cyber capacity building. So what we've done, what are sort of key steps that we've taken in 2015 and 2016? First of all, I think it's important um, uh, to build a, a personal network. A network where people know each other, where people can find each other. So that's what we facilitated in 2015. Also, and that was one of the, the needs of the, of the global community, is to create some overview on cyber capacity building. So we did it in, in different ways, uh, bringing together people um, also to, to challenge them to come up with, with, with uh, best practices. Um, there was a collaboration with, uh, with uh, there is still a, co a collaboration uh, with the Cyber Capacity Center in Oxford. And they had their portal trying to get an overview on what is going on around the world, what initiatives, what activities on cyber capacity, bu capacity building are going on. Um, if you talk about cyber capacity building, you want to be action oriented. So within the GFCE, we had the concept of initiatives or uh, so to say programs uh, where uh, members uh, uh, find each other, work together uh, and make it visible for the, for, and make their best practice visible for the, the global community and the GFC community. Um, we also produced like products. And if you talk about cyber capacity building, it's mostly about practical products, like toolkits, guidelines, uh, how to implement, for example, a cert, or how to deal with uh, vulnerability disclosure, or how to, um, how to develop cyber strategies, very practical things, topics, themes that, that almost everywhere in the, in the world uh, uh, people are looking for. Um, so that was 2015 and 2016. And I think it was a lot about awareness raising for cyber capacity building, making known what's, what's out there, what are best practices and that sort of things. In 2017, um, we developed the so-called Delhi Communique. So that was a high-level document presented at the Global Conference on Cyberspace in Delhi in 2017, at the end of 2017. And it was a sort of renewed commitment from the GFC community on cyber capacity building. Uh, it was also about awareness raising, but on a high level, that there's an urgency for cyber capacity building. And it was also a a framework was provided with it, uh, with teams and topics that are important. So now I come to the last part. So, so what's next? Um, so there are some, what we try to do, like I said, with the GFC community, step by step, is uh, to create an ecosystem for cyber capacity building. And what we've done in 2018 is starting with, the, with working groups along the lines of the teams of the Delhi Communique. And um, um, these working groups um, um, bring together uh, uh, members of the GFC who can support members who have a need and also the knowledge community and implementers. So this triangle is really important if you, if you move towards more implementation efforts. Um, another thing is what we develop and, what's, and what we try to do within the GFC is being some sort of a, a clearinghouse, not only for information, but also bringing together uh, needs and support. 
and to create a mechanism or a process to, to be able to do that and bring that together. And the last part, uh, another key element is to create an, a CCB, uh, Cyber Capacity Building Knowledge Portal, where the global community can find practical products, uh, information about lessons learned, how to implement, and also to, to see, to get an overview on, on what are initiatives, what are other projects worldwide on topics that matter to me. So, in a nutshell, um, what we do is, is, is step by step creating um, and facilitating uh, the global community uh, as a GFCE for cyber capacity building and, and creating this ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, David. I, um, I, the lady from the NRD, Aquile, I don't think, um, yeah. She's not uh, here, so Amanda, uh, <laughs> the next in line is you from Microsoft, if you want to uh, give your introductory remarks, thanks. Absolutely, thank you, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to, to be here on this panel today. I just wanna pick up on some of the, the comments that my colleagues have started us out with uh, and focus in, uh, in particular in the area of national L efforts to develop um, cybersecurity policies, particularly in the context of critical infrastructure protection, uh, and think about uh, why it's really important in the context of those developments to think about collaboration regionally and globally. And in particular, pick up on some of the comments that colleagues have made related to um, the importance of technical security not being sufficient, but also needing through these national efforts to build kind of cultural and social capacities uh, for cybersecurity risk management, as well as the importance of resiliency and the importance of forums like the GFCE for ensuring that there's kind of an opportunity to share best practices in cybersecurity risk management across borders. So in particular, you know, from our perspective, we are tracking lots of different national and regional efforts around the world that governments you know, are really making to, to ensure that their you know, local organizations have the cybersecurity capacity to deal with um, what's confronting them today. Um, and in particular, we're seeing lots of developments in the context of critical infrastructure protection as connectivity in those critical sectors really increases, the importance of this issue also increases, and so government attention in this area is really important. Just a few examples of some of the policies that I'm talking about. You know, in, the, in the EU, we have the Network and Information Security Directive, um, and China, there is the cybersecurity law that is being implemented that will impact uh, uh, many, many critical sectors. Singapore Cybersecurity Act. Um, and Japan, there's the development that's ongoing of the cyber physical security framework. These are just a few examples. There's lots of other sort of pending or in development legislation around the world uh, that intends to, to really think about how to ensure that uh, it's critical, uh, critical sectors are protected from a cybersecurity kind of perspective. Uh, and, and we're also in, in lots of national strategies, seeing lots of governments intending to do work in this space. And from our perspective, this is really, this is really important, and this is a really um, critical opportunity to spread cybersecurity capacity across critical sectors. Um, it, and so we're, we're really excited about the opportunity to engage on these government efforts. At the same time, there is a, a risk that some of these efforts you know, really introduce compliance-focused approaches that in some ways kind of bring resources that could otherwise be focused on cybersecurity risk management and just sort of compliance-focused approaches. And there's also a risk that some of these developments really fragment across both borders and sectors, and that could create new complexities for cybersecurity risk management. So we think this is a really important opportunity, but it's important that governments are thinking about you know, what we've learned thus far, and I think Greg's comments about um, really ensuring that there is an ability for um, actors and with their fingers on the keyboards to, to, be, re, to be agile and to enable resiliency. And I think it's also important that we think about you know, what different governments are doing across sectors to ensure that that sort of fragmentation um, is managed. So a, a, a couple of, of thoughts in particular on uh, the importance of you know, having risk-based approaches be foundational to what governments are doing in this space. Um, you know, from 
from our perspective, you know, the, this is picking up on some of the comments that I think Bill kicked us off with, again, with not just having technical aspects of, of security being important, but also thinking about the social and cultural uh, capacities that need to be developed. You know, I in no way want to suggest that some sort of um, controls-focused approaches, um, some more prescriptive approaches cannot be valuable, but from our perspective, it's really important that the foundation of cybersecurity risk management and operational risk management is in place for any organization, uh, as that's sort of the, the, the kind of foundational element that enables organizations to really have good conversations that build those sort of cultural and, and social capacities to really um, think from an organizational perspective, are we looking across our entire environment? Are we really processing the, the risk that we're taking on? Are we you know, really having a, a mature conversation about how we're managing those risks? Are we detecting threats and incidents? Are we prepared to respond to those incidents? Are we resilient? <laughs> these, are, these are the questions that really um, come to the surface when the conversation is based on a holistic approach to, to risk management. Um, from, from our perspective as a company, we actually use uh, something called the Cybersecurity Framework, um, which was initially developed by uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US in collaboration with lots of other governments and, and industry stakeholders really reflecting that sort of multi-stakeholder approach where you have lots of different folks coming together to really reflect their expertise and build uh, a best practice in cybersecurity risk management. We've also seen uh, the cybersecurity framework move into the ISO IEC world, which has been really exciting. Um, there was something developed or, or something published earlier this year called ISO IEC 27103. Uh, it's a technical report that really builds on the foundation established by the, the NIST cybersecurity framework and thinking about how to really have a holistic approach to cyber risk management and, and really brings that into kind of an international context and thinking about how to build on all of the ISO and IEC work that has been ongoing for the last decade or more in this space of, of information security uh, and, and really kind of grounds that in the holistic approach to, to risk management, the kind of identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover really the five kind of major steps that we see to a holistic risk management program in the cybersecurity context. Um, and so just maybe one or two more comments on, and again, why from our perspective, these two approaches are really valuable to, to think about. One, you know, we think that the cybersecurity uh, framework really enables that kind of conversation across an organization, uh, across kind of business groups and different functions within an organization. Uh, as well as kind of across the, the uh, within the ver like vertical parts of an organization up to kind of the senior leadership of an organization enables a really consistent conversation about cybersecurity risk management, which is really critical, again, to building those sort of cultural capacities as an organization to really make sure that the right investments are being made in cybersecurity. The other reason why we think those, those two uh, uh, reference points, and in particular ISO IEC 27103 are really valuable, that helps to kind of deal with that challenge that, that I mentioned at the outset of lots of different governments doing really important work in this space. There are challenges if governments develop really different approaches and having kind of the global ecosystem <laughs> and having fragmentation across that, both from a regional context and a sectoral context. So making sure that there's kind of efforts to look across borders and see what it, best practices are being developed um, and leveraging those at least as a starting point and figuring out where it makes sense to make adjustments for a national context I think is really important. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda. And I'm now uh, moving to uh, Juan Manuel Wilchis, um, Commissioner, the Commission de Regulación de Comunicaciones of the Government uh, from Colombia. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when we were preparing for the panel, uh, I took a look at the, what the panel said and what is the objective of it. Um, and it said that it's designed for stakeholders whose approach to cybersecurity is in infancy or underdeveloped. Uh, and I guess I can say that Colombia is an example of uh, we are still in our infancy, we're still developing our policies. We got something done in 2016 uh, and it came out based on collaboration and the work that we did to the OAS um, and also to the internal work. And I wanted to talk about or try to show a little bit of what happened in Colombia and how we came out with these policies. 
that uh, I guess is the first step. It's one of the first steps, and we need to continue working on that. Um, we had a policy in 2011. Uh, it was the first cybersecurity policy that we had for the country. It was aimed at capacity building, uh, trying to build up the institutional framework and who needed to work in uh, this um, cybersecurity environment. Um, and it worked for a couple of years, but then we found out that we were not collaborating, we were not working together. The Ministry of Defense was uh, on one side, the intelligence agencies were on another side, uh, the ICT industry was working on the other side. We didn't have uh, uh, critical infrastructure ident identification. We were not doing things pretty well. So um, we started to work on how to, how to manage, how to manage to, to get to a different stage in the development of our policies. And we looked for uh, help from the OAS, uh, from, for experts, international experts. We needed to learn from other countries, developed countries. We had a lot of uh, support from the UK, the US, uh, a lot of countries, uh, France. Um, and, uh, uh, but the thing was that we spent uh, almost two th all 2014 and 15 trying to discuss things. Uh, we had a lot of participation, experts recommending stuff, recommending uh, uh, lines of uh, work that we needed to implement. But uh, I guess we were lacking the most important thing uh, for any uh, country which is to have um, a strategic vision within the country for the need to implement a policy uh, that is over, like, encompasses the whole um, digital security environment. That is not only about defense, or is not only about security, uh, and is not only about uh, ICTs or networks. We needed to, to do something that encompassed uh, the whole thing. And we needed to, to think in the same uh, line of thought, the whole of government, so um, I guess for that, we had some uh, help, if I can say it like that. It was mo most uh, like a push forward by the OECD. We were in the accession process to the organization. And uh, in September 2015, the Digital Security Risk Management uh, recommendation came out. Uh, I remember coming to Paris and having in December 2015 uh, requests from OECD you need to take a decision on your next policy on cybersecurity or you're not gonna access to the organization. So I guess that made us think uh, as a government in just one, one way, like with one focus, one objective. Um, and once we issued the, the policy was April 2016, um, it was, we were one of the first countries to issue the cybersecurity policy based on uh, the recommendations with the OECD. And I guess it has served as an example for other countries in the region. We've continued working with the OES. Uh, we are learning as well as we are giving to other countries. So I guess we have to have that view of, of, of collaboration. Uh, you, you never start learning about uh, different stuff uh, that you need to implement in this kind of environment because the digital environment changes so quickly that we need to be, uh, and be updated every day. And I wanted to highlight just some ideas, uh, the most important stuff uh, of th that process. Um, as I mentioned, during 2014 and 15, we worked, we collaborated with OAS. We had a lot, we had a lot of experts. Um, we had good recommendations from, from those experts, but we had a lack of commitment from government stakeholders in the country, in Colombia. Um, one of the groups, civil society, was requesting more participation in the discussion. That wasn't happening as, as well as, 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 uh, as good, uh, like, uh, they, had, they didn't have a good participation. And that probably was one of the things that were, they were criticizing a lot, the process of building up the policy. So uh, we got the push from the OECD uh, for the accession process. And I guess we needed a common, we needed a common objective uh, and the agreement uh, based on the highest level of government, the Ministry of Defense, the Minister of ICTs, the Presidency, once we got that common objective of, in this case, accession to OECD, we found out that we needed to um, come out with a uh, unique solution to the problem of adopting a policy that included security, defense, uh, social, economic objectives, the whole, uh, all of them combined for just one solution. Uh, and we needed that strategic vision that I mentioned at the beginning. 
so once that highest level of government, of government uh, was agreed on, on what needed to be done, uh, the work flowed more easily. We uh, agreed on uh, an agenda, discussion, uh, uh, working groups, uh, uh, like different tables where we sat with different stakeholders to discuss the issues that we needed to, to, to define. And um, we came out with a very simple policy, I guess. We're, uh, as I mentioned, in the process of building it still. Uh, it, it's based on basic, four basic principles. The first one is to safeguard human rights. Uh, second one is to adopt a collaborative approach. It's important to, to, to uh, imprint that in the mind of the different decision makers uh, and the, all the different stakeholders. We need to collaborate. If not, it, it won't work. Uh, we're guaranteeing shared responsibility and we're adopting the risk management approach uh, defined by the OECD. And uh, we defined different dimensions for that. Uh, I guess some of, of, my, uh, of, of, of the speakers before have talked about this. The first one is governance. Uh, we needed to define a structured institutional framework in which we took decisions about that. So the presidency took that role. They're the ones leading the discussion because they can, uh, they can combine the interests of the different stakeholders, defense, they want to protect, they want to control, they want to, uh, but the other stakeholders, uh, civil society wants human rights to be protected, and the Ministry of ICTs or the Ministry of Economy, we need uh, economic development. So we need to combine all those uh, objectives in just one. Um, uh, we have cyclical and systematic management of risk, that's implementation of the recommendation. We're, we developed one of the dimensions of the work is the culture in citizens. We need to create awareness in the different stakeholders. Uh, I guess uh, my fellow panelists uh, have talked about that a lot more. Uh, and we have to start from the beginning, teach everyone in the country, uh, tell them what is uh, digital security, why they need to protect, starting by their cell phones, uh, and how we need to protect ourselves, and do some capacity capacity building, collaborate, continue to work with other countries, continue to, uh, as I was saying, um, give information as well as learn from the other countries. And I guess that's, that's the, the key to it all. And uh, I just want to mention a couple of uh, data statistics that we have. Uh, the CRC is working on a definition of how telecom companies need to um, implement those policies. Uh, we made a, a survey with them and we found out the, that we're not still collaborating as well as we would like to. Uh, we're not sharing information about incidents, for example. 78% of operators don't send that information to the CERT, national CERT. And 64% um, of them don't coordinate with the CERT. Uh, all that, the, those activities, There's, there are no uh, specified protocols yet uh, for the whole implementation of digital security. So we need to work a little bit more on that. Uh, I guess what I'm showing is uh, we started, we did something, it's good, but we need to continue working on it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And last but not least, uh, Carrie-Anne Barrett uh, from the cybersecurity uh, policy, uh, you're a cybersecurity policy specialist um, at the OIS. Um, I think I wanted to start by probably building and tying together the discussions that's happening here. Um, from those who don't know, the Organization of American States, we have within us a cybersecurity program. Um, how we approach capacity building is threefold in that we look at it, we try to look at it holistically, recognizing that in order to address, as Amanda pointed out, the risk, even looking at some of the risks that um, countries or companies or individuals face, you have to kind of examine, okay, what is happening? One, do persons have the knowledge that they are at risk? So within our program, we have an entire section dedicated to research. Some of the reports that we've produced are some of the first in Latin America actually addressing the threat of cybersecurity and what's happening. We had, we've been publishing reports since 2012, and the reports often try to pull together um, all the experiences from our member states um, in terms of what they are seeing as the threat in the region. Um, the other aspect in knowing, okay, how do I approach my risk is, secondly, do I have the capacity to identify that I am at risk? So our program focuses on building the capacity of technical persons within our region. We build the capacity of our legal per persons. We look at awareness raising 
as you pointed out, in terms of does my citizens, do they know that they're at risk and what they can do to protect themselves? The third approach that we take in tying all of those things together is to look at capacity building from a more political level. Um, and we take that political view from a policy development and even a cybersecurity framework development um, perspective. So just follow the thought in the sense that if it is that at an international level there is no agreement that capacity building needs to happen, it wouldn't necessarily drill down into the national level and then even grassroots the citizens themselves. So at the OAS in 2004, we actually had published a hemispheric cybersecurity framework which laid out to all our member states that there is a need to develop national cybersecurity policies, that there is a need to establish national incident response teams, and there is a need to actually raise the awareness level of our citizens in the region. Um, so taking it from that perspective, the program then works with our member states to build out national cybersecurity strategies. Why is that important? Is because it gives from the international, now regional, then to the national level, the government's the aptitude and even the mandate to build out capacity within their country. So most of our national cybersecurity strategies, which we have about 10 in the region now, we're kind of proud of that because in just one year alone, we had four countries publishing strategies. And for us, it's important because it means that there's a political consciousness, that there's a need to build cybersecurity strategy. And we, each time we do go into our member state to do it, we take it from a whole of government and a whole of nation approach. And the whole of government and whole of nation looks into the fact that you do have a need to bring together public-private partnership. So we do roundtable discussions. We then also look at how can we leverage on international players that have experience. We bring them to the table. So we have donors such as the UK, Canada, the USA that actually partner with us to go into country to bring that best experience into the country as well. And the whole of government, whole of nation takes into account how do we have civil society at the table. For example, for Guatemala, Mexico, even Colombia, civil society commented critically on the development of the strategy process. And what we had really loved is that the government was very transparent with the development because it was published on the relevant websites. It allowed public feedback, and that public feedback fed back into the drafts. For example, with Costa Rica, the process was led by a NGO for the comment period, and they actually took notes, fed that back to the government, and the strategy was actually improved in all cases, especially in Guatemala, we saw it as such a critical factor in it. Um, in Mexico as well, the multi-stakeholder approach worked where we actually had a day dedicated to civil society, where we presented to civil society at their individual roundtable all the strategy issues and they actually commented as well. So I think if you approach the problem from a risk-based approach, I think you also have to look where are my threat vectors? And I think in terms of knowing what is tolerable for you, it's not just from a technical perspective, but you also have to look at it from a soft perspective. Yeah. So our, if, my, if a nation needs to be cyber secure, and my citizens aren't aware, my technical persons aren't trained up, and the political level, there's no will, then the risk is very big. And then globally, it actually, it galvanizes <laughs> because then there's no cooperation internationally if I can't trust you then. So the perspective I think that we would want to add is, um, approaching capacity building from a risk-based approach means looking at capacity building from a whole of government, a whole of nation approach, and a multi-stakeholder model should not just think about involving civil society, but involving everyone, public sector, private sector, academia, civil society, and even the end user and the citizens that are actually part of the process. Um, I think on that end, I'll probably close and then open the floor. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I heard a lot of interesting uh, thoughts from uh, the, the speakers uh, and certainly everybody highlighted the importance uh, of building also the social cultural capacity, uh, the fact of approaching the problem from an holistic standpoint, uh, the importance of involving everyone at the table in a multi-stakeholder fashion. The digital environment is certainly evolving, so we need to uh, constantly update each other. And um, certainly cybercrime, cybersecurity is recognized as an important problem, and everyone more or less highlighted also the importance of these collaborative approaches. But um, now I would like also to um, open up the floor 
uh, from uh, for the audience questions comment uh, if you all also want to react to any comments that the speakers have done um, it, it's really a welcome so I I'm looking around to see if there is a first courageous person that would like to uh, to start and break the ice no oh yeah please Hi, <clears throat> I'm with the, uh, with the Israeli uh, Ministry of Justice, and we're involved in uh, developing Israel's uh, legal framework for um, cybersecurity. And one issue that keeps recurring, and actually Israel hosted a um, panel last year on this topic, but we're still uh, in the thick of things, uh, and I'd be really interested to hear what the panelists have to say, is this tension between, on one hand, citizens want their government to take care of things, to be responsible, to uh, devise the right incentives, adopt the right standards, etc. And on the other hand, there's this um, uh, skepticism or uh, fear that once it does that, the government will hold too much power, too much information. And so th th this inherent tension is still um, I think something that countries that are trying to implement a good cybersecurity ecosystem are struggling with or may be struggling with. So I'd be curious to see if you've encountered this, um, this uh, kind of tension and how you suggest going about resolving it. Anyone? That, yeah, please. So I think one can look at the, uh, the, the concept of the voluntary uh, risk-based approach as one model, as mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, you know that that Microsoft and NIST and others in the U.S. have have uh, used, where that multi-stakeholder conversation, you know, to uh, identify what are the priorities. So I think that's one of the real challenges is getting that multi-stakeholder so you can you can identify and at least discuss the tensions and have a a uh, conclusion that respects those those tensions. I think people understand there is a tension. Um, Certainly in the U.S. we haven't quite uh, worked it all out, but I think that, um, you know, that's one approach to consider. Please. I mean, just to build on that, I mean, part of the uh, cybersecurity capacity building model, or the, 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 certainly the one that we look at from the Oxford perspective, is, is that it builds in policy on privacy freedom of expression. I mean, I think it's important for people to realize that capacity building in cybersecurity is not narrowly focused on cybersecurity only, but how do you balance that with uh, other values? And, and so that has to just be continually built into a process of, of uh, capacity building means that you also uh, get, uh, protect privacy, freedom of expression, and that these values are not forgotten in the process of trying to secure computer systems and so forth. I think it's part of what I spoke to earlier about transparency of government. I think that helps as well because if citizens are confident that the government is transparent with the process of digital development and as Bill pointed out, if human rights is by design and security is by design as it's the term that's been floated now, it's, I think it's, it's, it's critical that the transparency helps. So as I'm building out a digital economy and facilitating an environment that a cybersecurity industry can thrive, the government is transparent that I, I'm considering human rights, I'm considering security. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, the, the one thing maybe I would just underline that's already been brought up in response is I think the process of developing and implementing some of these policies is really important. We talk a lot about the substance of the policy, what it looks like, um, and I, that, of course, is important as well. But from our perspective, if you have a really good process, then you can likely get to a good outcome. Um, and so, you know, it's been highlighted. Carrie Ann, you talked a, a, a bit about just like the the really robust process that you've gone through to make sure there is a whole of nation and whole of government approach. Really having everyone come come to the table. Greg, what you mentioned about the, the NIST cybersecurity framework process, that was a year-long process developing that, uh, and it was really intensive. There were multiple workshops all over the United States 
where folks came together and really talked about these issues and what the impl implications of different approaches might be. There were multiple comment opportunities even just before the first version of the framework was published. Um, and even since, you know, it's been four years since the first version of the framework was published that was just recently updated with V1.1 this year. In between, I think there have been another three or four comment opportunities just for stakeholders to have a chance to provide input on. How is, how is it going? How is the implementation of this going? What, what, what are unexpected um, issues that have arisen? What are new risks that aren't being considered? Um, so I think, you know, just, just, just to underline, I think what other colleagues have said, the process um, can be really important, not only to getting to an effective approach, but also to, to building trust. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Well, I, I, I was thinking on, on something that happened in Colombia about three years ago. Uh, there was a security uh, issue happening through WhatsApp. Some uh, people, uh, they were writing stuff on, on WhatsApp. And the Minister of Defense came out to say that uh, uh, we as a country needed to block social networks and communication needed to be controlled because it was affecting security uh, in the country. Um, and I guess um, that's part of a reflection of when you don't have a clear idea of uh, the effects of the decisions that you take as Ministry of Defense in terms of uh, how it affects citizenship. Um, I don't say that that, it, that he was wrong. I, I guess it was what he was trying to solve because it was his problem. Uh, but um, I, I come with the, uh, I'm gonna take a highlight what Karian said about the uh, think about uh, protecting human rights, protecting uh, privacy, what the other uh, panelists have said. Um, when, you, when all the different stakeholders are thinking on those terms, you need to consider the whole thing, the whole framework. You cannot think on your, on your part and then uh, un, uh, don't, don't, don't get to consider the other uh, points of view. Uh, you, 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 you end up allowing for participation of different, different stakeholders. You end up having discussion, discussions, you end up having workshops, and you end up building uh, those uh, kind of policy like this with some principles. One of the principles is human rights. You need to protect uh, uh, citizens. You need to protect uh, their communication uh, rights. You need to protect their fundamental rights. And uh, all of us have to be aware of that, even if it's Ministry of Defense, Telecommunications, uh, Intelligence, whoever it is. We need to have those principles uh, in place. OK. Um, yes. You wanted to react? Of course, of course. <laughs> I just, I think there's sort of a tension on the panel about a couple of issues, and I just want to raise that with my friend. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the goal here. That's yeah. Raise the issue. One is, I think, first of all, this, um, I, I think I totally believe in distributed agency, but also not fragmentation. And I think fragmentation is a real problem. I, I, it was really interesting when I, talk to uh, our researchers when they come back from country reviews and uh, one of the pro one part of the process first of all obviously in the United States there must be what 17 or more agencies charged with cybersecurity and uh, it is distributed and and often fragmented as well but in smaller countries it there is more of an argument for more centralized or some agency taking a lead and um, just two two issues with that. One, uh, when, when our researchers would bring stakeholders together from across the government, across, they would remark to the researchers, this is the first time we've actually been in the same room together. And this, uh, we haven't been talking. And, and so that shouldn't happen. I mean, this, is, this should be, this should be, uh, there should be interaction and discussion across these various fragmented or distributed agents. And the other is, I don't think, is there, I guess this is a question, is there necessarily a, a conflict between um, enrolling government, enrolling people across uh, government and citizens with a multi-stakeholder model? That is the multi-stakeholder model. That, in other words, you can't, if you only have the technical community focused on cybersecurity, you don't have the resources, you don't have buy-in from government, you don't have citizens thinking that, the, that they have share some of the responsibility for this. 
So a, a true multi-stakeholder model is, is a really distributed agency. <laughs> but you have to, uh, it's often the case that it's not just government control of the process, it's government enrolling government in the process. And you can't enroll government in the process without giving, you know, uh, well, anyway, it, it, am I off base? No, I, 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 I concur with you. You don't want chaos yes. to come out. Uh, but I think your comment that this, you said this was the first time they were getting together, and I think that's a really important notion of trust building. You have to have those face-to-face -face mm -hmm. conversations. If you look at how, you know, some of these coalitions that have responded over the years to various uh, incidents, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, not Petya, uh, you know, mm -hmm. the Morris Worm, I mean, the whole history of major global incident response, it's been about people who form and norm quickly to uh, build trust and respond, uh, at, at least at a technical level, um, quickly to, to, to incidents. And that's, you know, it's, it's without that face-to-face, -face, that trust building capacity, because at the end of the day, no, no cybersecurity response capacity is going to work in isolation. You know, it's going to be connected, and it has, you have to build those relationships, uh, even, if, even if only if, it, if it's somewhat centralized. You want to pick up? Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes, and maybe to add to this, I think it's, it's not about, like primarily not about like uh, having the conversation, but it's like really working together. Participation, public, private, and if you have that, then you build trust, and then you can see you change. Like if I look back at the Netherlands, where I'm coming from, in 2010, 2011, um, the thought was like, okay, regulation, that's, that's, that's not like within cyberspace, the government shouldn't, um, shouldn't start with regulation. The private sector can do it themselves in a voluntary way. But now, when, when, we, when the Netherlands moved on and we had this multi-stakeholder approach with participation, with all kinds of projects, building capacity building together, then also the conversation about what are the roles and responsibilities came up in a more, in, in more depth. And, and now it's, I think it's, and in a lot of countries, it's, it's, uh, it's acknowledged that, that the governments have a role in regulation. How and how far? That's the second question, that they have a responsibility on that. Um, thank you. And as usual, the, the lively, interesting discussion starts when the time is up, unfortunately. But, <laughs> but what I would like now the, the speakers really to focus on in our uh, few minutes which are left is on the way forward. What are your suggestions? What shall we be doing on, uh, to, to favor and maybe to, to also help have these collaborative approaches and avoid fragmentation? Or what is your suggestion in general to, the, to this approach? If you in one, two minutes, if you would like to end up the panel with, with a suggestion. Anyone who would like to start with? Well, I, th I mean, I think one of the things uh, we, that came out of our discussions at the conference and so forth was to highlight best practice in a variety of areas. And I, I think there's that's something almost everyone agrees on, and, and uh, we can even argue over what is the best practice, but if we can have some case studies of best practice, both in regional and global collaboration, data sharing, for example, um, and in national capacity building, um, that, that could be a, have a positive role, I think. Anyone else that would like to go next? Uh, yeah. Yes, um, I think it's, it's important that we um, convince on a high and on a political level that, that, that money spent on cyber capacity building is well spent money. I think that's, that's very important. I think from our perspective, it's, um, I think thinking about multi-stakeholder and capacity building more holistically, not, we usually think about it with just involving civil society, but it's a little bit more. We want civil society, international players, private sector, everyone around the table, because I think if we only isolate it to just one stakeholder grouping, we miss out on how large a conversation could be and how much we could leverage on what everyone has to do to improve capacity building. Uh, well, I just wanted to say of, of what uh, Bill and Greg were, were talking about uh, a while ago, 
but uh, how government should be, shouldn't be the only one leading the discussion or shouldn't be the only one uh, talking about this. It could probably be that government is the one uh, that uh, puts everyone together, uh, builds up the, the stage or the, the venue for, for having the discussion, but government ne needs to consider everyone in the table. Uh, and when I say everyone, I, 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 I wanted to say civil society, private uh, sector, uh, all the governmental institutions, the uh, regional, like OAS uh, organizations, and international experts, uh, people from other countries that could uh, provide some uh, additional knowledge, uh, experiences, uh, best practices, and we need to listen to all of that. So it's a, a very uh, detailed work that needs to be done. It doesn't take uh, just a month or you need to work and you need to do it uh, appropriately, having everyone uh, on the table. I'll just agree with my colleagues in closing. I think you know, having governments take next steps and acting as conveners for a really robust multi-stakeholder process for thinking through you know, how to really help organizations at the national level and individuals at the national level understand cybersecurity risks and really build effective cybersecurity risk management programs is really important. And then beyond that, thinking about some of these regional forums for working on these issues like OAS, like GFC, I think are really important for sharing some of those best practices uh, across borders and really you know, having that exchange between governments that you talked about. I really like the way that you framed it in terms of you, know, you, you took information in and you shared information back out and that should really be an ongoing process of continuous improvement. I think the other issue that was brought up earlier was thinking about how to elevate this issue, right? There's lots of work that needs to happen across all of these stakeholders at the national level. Um, really engaging political leaders is also valuable to just really get the buy-in and the investment in this issue. So I think about other forums um, in which in the next year we can really work on this issue, the G20 being one, really thinking about how in the G20 we can promote effective, interoperable approaches to cybersecurity risk management across across the across the G20 governments I think would be really valuable. Um, and other kind of global and regional forums, I think there are lots of places to really increase awareness of these issues and, and that would be a really valuable next step and, and really promote some of the, the best practices that may be relevant in different circumstances across the world. So, thank you. Yeah, and Bill, you wanted to, uh, no, sorry. Part of what we were discussing up here is that we have another 25 minutes, yes. I think, so we, we, we want to, of course, we'll use the time. Uh, but kind of a, to your request for a kind of a, a observation, uh, kind of a closing, but, you know, the technical community has provided the cybersecurity through their agency. On the other hand, the technical community, particularly the research community, has failed to provide easy cybersecurity. I mean, if cybersecurity was effective, you know, if things weren't buggy, uh, we probably really wouldn't be here. You know, part of my vision is that in 100 years, hopefully sooner, we won't be having these conversations because we'll have a better understanding of how to uh, uh, incorporate resilience and security. Um, so in the meantime, we need that multi-stakeholder approach. We need that engagement. We need the technical community to be humble to recognize that they aren't delivering what society now wants, which is that resilience and that security. And I think that's really where that, uh, you know, being part of the risk conversation, being part of the multi-stakeholder process uh, is really important. But hopefully in 100 years, we won't be having the same conversation. Okay, I just, uh, I totally agree with that. And the, uh, we're sort of beyond the point of uh, fear campaigns and blaming users for uh, cyber security problems. It's not all the technical, com but yes, we need, we need uh, approaches to security that users can employ uh, uh, reasonably. I'd just like to add a point that, um, that's really become a priority for us at, at, at the Oxford Cyber Security Center, which, which is um, as this turn comes and that people recognize this, the uh, centrality of security and, and are pouring more resources into capacity building of uh, government resources, public resources into capacity building around the world and regionally, it is becoming more and more imperative that we show it matters, that it works. 
we need evidence. We need, uh, and so w one of the things we're doing uh, is, is trying to work with the uh, field research that we're doing in uh, now 60 some countries and the, where there's a capacity building model that's being employed by, the, by our center and uh, where we have data about exactly what's going on in, in terms of capacity building. We're trying to build a, uh, data sets that will provide evidence-based support uh, that capacity building actually pays off that it matters uh, I mean, and and this is not any it's the thing is uh, you think well this is common sense you uh, you pour money into capacity building you put money in it it works it'll work but uh, you uh, public leaders are, are uh, obviously and uh, rightfully questioning you know okay is this is this paying off so we need real evidence-based support for the the impact of capacity building and uh, and we're we're working on that we're developing that I think that'll be something we'll talk about later this afternoon in another session as, as well thank you and uh, since we have uh, more time than what I thought uh, then if there are other questions also from uh, from the floor it would be a uh, great also comments or remote uh, yeah Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Warner. I was one of the co-organizers of this panel with Carolyn. And I just wanted to ask a question concerning um, in various multilateral organizations, there have been some countries that have preferred um, or advocated for um, uh, bringing the creation of cybersecurity frameworks under a governmental entity. Um, what I'm hearing um, from all of you up there is that you feel that um, th that is an overarching governmental entity, that this sort of top-down approach is not really optimal in terms of enabling a flexible response. Um, did, did I understand you correctly? Thank you. Anyone that would like to react? Yes, I'm here. I think I would but, um, jump on it quickly because um, I think it's quite the opposite. Um, the conclusion should be it's not a matter that it should not be nested in a governmental entity and a top down. It's a matter that we find and we found in the region that more and more government is realizing that they have to be outward looking as well. Ultimate the responsibility as the question we had here. The government is responsible for safety and security of its citizen. It's also responsible for economic development and growth and prosperity of its citizen. But in doing that, I think with cybersecurity, it's one of the few topics where governments are recognizing, not that they haven't, they're recognizing they can't go alone. So cybersecurity is one of the few topics that has brought together all players around the table to ensure that we get it right. So I would probably disagree the conclusion you had and probably say definitively that it's, it's now not top down, but it's more Pluristics. It's whole of government, whole of nation now coming together. We usually have the terms separate, but I think there's a need now to merge both into one to address cybersecurity. Yeah, I, I would, I would, I want to agree that it, it really, you know, given like the impact on elections, on public safety, uh, you know, and the fact that you can exploit platforms in new ways that, uh, again, designers hadn't, the engineers hadn't anticipated, uh, and users have taken uh, platforms and directions that, you know, weren't really predictable. Uh, I think that, I agree that that whole society involvement is important because it really is affecting so many different aspects. So, and just, I, yeah, I think it could be really characterized as a mix of those approaches, right? You have the, the top down um, in the sense of government really acting as a convener to bring these conversations together and having the responsibility to do so, as well as, you know, bottom up in the sense that a lot of the kind of recognition of what's effective and, and the kind of technical capacity uh, and the best practices in cybersecurity risk management are coming from the community. So it's, it's a bit of a, 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 a mix of approaches, I'd say, and that's why, again, it's so important that it's a multi-stakeholder process. Yes, please.
any of the speakers would like to? Well, um, one, of, one of the things that, uh, one of the objectives, the dimensions of the policy that we have in Colombia is the development and improvement of the legal and regulatory framework. Um, it's not, um, I'll give you the example of what we're doing at CRC. We came out with, uh, we had a decision from 2008 to 9 regarding the standards, technical standards that were needed to be applied by telecom operators in terms of what their networks need to have in terms of security. And it was based on uh, ITU uh, Series X, I guess, um, recommendations. Uh, a lot of uh, technical specifications, but the thing is that when we discussed that uh, last uh, year, year and a half, we found out that most of the operators were working themselves on the 27,000 uh, ISO uh, standards. Uh, so our regulation didn't, did not, uh, was not, did not agree with the, what with the industry was, was doing. So what we did, we did a survey with them. Uh, that's where I got the statistics that I mentioned. Uh, and a lot of them, I, I guess 80 something percent, 90 percent of operators were working with ISO standards. Um, so when you, when you were working from the legal point of view or the regulatory point of view, you need to understand to go down and work with the different uh, uh, parties that need to comply with uh, all of these uh, uh, decisions um, to find out what they're doing because we need to understand what they have, uh, probably they have some developments, they have done some things, uh, they have things in place. And you cannot uh, take for granted that what you say in your law or what you say in your, your regulation is going to be implemented and the effect that that's going to have in terms of cost and uh, well, the impact on uh, citizens or the companies that are, are implementing it. So I guess like with every other uh, uh, topic that we've discussed today is that you need to work with the industry, you need to work with the, uh, the ones that are going to comply with those laws. Uh, to find out what is, what's the best way and how to start with. Uh, you cannot start with a very complex framework if you don't uh, have the basics uh, in the case of, of what the CRC is doing. Uh, we didn't, uh, we understood, we found out that the companies, telecom companies didn't have uh, the definition of policies based on uh, risk management and approach. They didn't have that. So what we started, what we obliged them to do was start by defining a policy based on risk management and start working on that. And we had a, uh, a deadline for that in a couple of years. And we do monitoring, we're gonna do monitoring in the next few years. And we, we're gonna have to um, go uh, with them, work with them in the next following years to implement step by step, by step all the different uh, uh, regulations and standards and things that need to be implemented. So I guess it's also a discussion process so that you have to work together with them. Actually, I have a question for you. How much in the legal profession, in your experience, how uh, multi-stakeholder oriented are, I mean, are lawyers familiar with multi-stakeholder processes? They are familiar. Excellent. I'm very glad to hear that. So, uh, but I hear what you're saying that they, 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 there's capacity building needs there also. Uh, my, yeah. And my experience is only as lawyers who are digital native, only as people who are digital natives become more mature in their career and become lawyers, you know, that seems to be the, the answer, <laughs> unfortunately. Thank you. I, I have a minority opinion about these issues, but I think that the, uh, first of all, I don't think there are as many legal problems as other, some other people do. And, and for, I think anything that is unlawful offline is also unlawful online. <laughs> it is not the Wild West. The law applies to online behavior. And therefore, uh, bespoke laws for online behavior are often maybe uh, driven by a sense of the, there's a necessity for activity or we must do some policy or some legal process. To, but, but generally the central problem in the cyber crime area is, is coordination internationally and, and, and implementation of law in, in a gl more global sense. And, that, and that's why cyber crime is one of the areas in which there's a lot of 
uh, that that area is leading some of the uh, efforts at coordination and data sharing on a more international level. But I think that if, if I could make a uh, plea to legal and regulatory thinking, it would be that you, we have not yet come up with a re legal regulatory model that works for the internet, okay? Th that uh, too many uh, policymakers, politicians, lawmakers are trying to apply frameworks built for other media to the internet. It, it is not a broadcaster. It is not a common carrier. It's not the post office. It's uh, the, uh, the internet is a, a, a very unique hybrid media. And when people import law and regulation based on a broadcast model to the internet, then they start spending time arresting somebody for tweeting an untoward comment, et cetera. So, th so I think the most uh, highest priority has to be careful thinking about uh, regulatory models that really work within the context of the internet and social media uh, that are so different from traditional, other traditional media and we can't just import uh, regulation and models from uh, traditional media to the internet context. The questioner is agreeing with that. <laughs> Any other um, questions from the audience? So one, one thing also that I wanted to, um, to ask to you, because we were discussing fragmentation and the distribution within agencies, but then Amanda also brought up the fact that there are various initiatives at global level from different government which are brought up. So my curiosity is like, how can we avoid also the, apart from the complexity, but also the creation of um, doubling standards, uh, for example, and not respecting international standards, is there a risk? How can we avoid that? Is there a way that, that we, we can bring collaborative efforts uh, to this type of fragmentation? And I don't know if anyone wants to jump in on that. So I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a, po I'm not a policymaker, uh, but I want to emphasize the notion of experimentation. Uh, you know, the European model as well as the US model allows entities to experiment with different regulatory frameworks before things are nationalized and globalized. And I think that's an important thing to remember here is that uh, there's opportunities for experimentation and different regulatory frameworks to be tried out uh, to see what works uh, and what doesn't. Uh, you know, as you scale up regulations, you know, and as the internet scales, there's always new surprises. And uh, we're, we're going through that now with, with social media. Um, but that ability to, that flexibility to experiment, I think is really crucial um, as, part of, as part of the process. Thank you. So I, I, mean, I would jump in on, you mentioned two different kinds of fragmentation, right? At the national level and the development of some of um, these cybersecurity initiatives, you can have different government agencies having different perspectives. Um, and then at the global level, of course, having, again, different governments kind of bring different initiatives to the table, different approaches to the table. Yeah, I, I think at the national level, the, the, my colleagues here have talked a, a lot about making sure that there's a, a, a government convener that really has, have, um, you know, develop consistent principles that can be applied across government and really ensure there's coordination across government. I think, you know, that, that same kind of concept can be applied at the international level, although I think the process is quite different, of course, and you have regional and international organizations that hopefully help to facilitate that coordination at the international level. I think you mentioned you know, international standards. I think you know, there, there's definitely something to be said for the experimentation that happens at the national level before um, the, the processes or approaches are sufficiently mature to make their way into an international standards process. And I think absolutely you need to give the ecosystem the time and space to go through that process. As different approaches do mature and they move into the international standards context, it seems that that is really, you know, international standards really are something that help to facilitate uh, interoperability and consistency on a global basis. Um, and I think from my perspective, I think is that that's one of the inputs from, uh, from a national perspective in developing approaches to something like cybersecurity risk management 
you know, thinking about both having those conversations across governments, leveraging international standards, uh, and, and really, from my perspective as well, recognizing the importance of interoperability and, and fragmentation, or in, and limiting fragmentation, um, is that's, a, that's just an important mindset um, to, to really uh, start from. Um, so I mentioned one international, it's, it's a um, report, ISO IEC 27103, which to me is really relevant in the cybersecurity risk management process, it really, or context, it really establishes uh, a process that seems like it can be used consistent, consistently across both sectors and um, different national approaches. I think we have to recognize that governments are different, they're not going to necessarily just cut and paste an international standard. Um, they might really have uh, good reasons for making some tweaks or some adaptations for their national context. But where there are international standards and there have been sort of sufficiently ma mature practices to move into the international standard, standard space, starting from that point um, and then making those kind of adaptations to the local context seems like an approach that really helps to, to limit fragmentation. Yes, please. I just want to, I'm not sure about that because the, uh, it's very hard to experiment in this area. It's really dangerous. I think the, uh, I wouldn't talk about international standards. I would say international implications of, so a judge in a, a one nation, a judge can make, have a ruling that has international implications. <laughs> and the fact that, uh, uh, a, a directive from the EU will not just be an EU directive, it'll be something that has implications worldwide because of, the, of a global internet. So that, um, so it, please don't experiment. <laughs> please think through these things and we need people who really understand the internet that, that are that are making these policies and making these judgments because they have international repercussions that are usually unintended, unexpected, and and uh, not good. <laughs> Did you want to add? <laughs> well, it's it's just that I think you 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 are perpetually in that state. There's no unicorn out there who, you know, unicorn oracle that can tell you, here's the implication of that policy. Mm -hmm because once you make it, again, the internet will, is going to continue to grow. I mean, we've got another, you know, three and a half billion people to add yet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we've got the IoT uh, tidal wave coming. Um, and so it has to be flexible. And, and I think also we have to admit when we've made a mistake. I mean, in the U.S. we have, uh, you know, we were trying to control uh, media copyright issues and it had the unintended consequence of, of making it challenging to do cybersecurity research. Uh, and, you know, legitimate, uh, you know, government-funded cybersecurity research. And that was a totally unintended consequence. Yeah. Uh, and it goes to somewhat the, you know, the, 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 the training of the legal, the, the policy makers at the time, uh, but you'll always be in that state. I don't, you know, anyone who says they understand how the internet really works, they understand some part of it, but, you know, that's why we have these meetings here where, where we have this collective knowledge to, inform the policy choices, but ultimately, we've got to be able to admit when we're wrong, and that's part of what an experiment is about, figuring out, oh, well, that's not quite the right answer, and we need change. That's, I, I think, um, I just wanted to add one thing. It's one of the reasons why, from the OAS perspective, we always encourage that multi-stakeholder model. It's a bit wider because nobody has the complete picture, mm. because even within government, one ministry is doing something, the other isn't, so the constant dialogue and as a part of our strategy development, we try to ensure that there is a built-in review process. And when we do training with our governments, when they do strategies, we say to them, don't wait until the end of the two years to review. Mm. Sometimes do a mid-review in six months because maybe what you thought was a good policy position six months ago, the internet and technology has changed so much. Maybe you have to change your strategy midway. Re maybe not redo the process, but redo the focus of the policy, if anything. So it's something that we encourage that the most stakeholder, it should never be locked in into this thinking. It's just one format it needs to take. It has to be all person speaking all the time because mm. everyone has a little bit of the puzzle. Mm. As you said, that's why we get it wrong sometimes as well. Mm.
Yeah, and certainly um, it's difficult also to calculate all the unintended consequences with, uh, with an internet which is, and the devices which are, uh, you know, technologies which are emerging every day if, and, and constantly. So apart from being flexible, are there other advices that you would give to policymaker apart from certainly not experimenting and thinking broadly and consulting uh, technical people and, and all of the stakeholders, but is there anything else apart from flexibility that you would like to uh, see built in a, in a policy? Any, any other suggestions? I'll, I'll jump in and, uh, and, and say I, maybe experimentation is the wrong word. I think there is a recognition that you know, there are going to be some efforts uh, in the national space, uh, and you know, I think if from even um, what what you were just saying, Carrie Ann, right, there is going to be that effort in the national space, and it should be ongoing, um, and there should be a continuous process of improvement. I think that's another principle to think about beyond flexibility, right, ensuring that there's recognition that continuous improvement is really important as well. I, I think maybe one way to bridge the, the thinking about this topic is to say, yeah, that's why, you know, from our perspective, having the multi-stakeholder approach to developing any of those policies is really important because hopefully you are limiting some of those challenges and then the continuous improvement process is really ensuring that there's a, a way to go back and, and fix mis mistakes um, and think about implications. I, I, I think I wouldn't necessarily say that the recognizing maybe the word experimentation is not the best word, that that doesn't create the necessity of thinking about international standards. I, I think what I was trying to recognize is that there could be a national process for developing and thinking about policy and then looking to the international space and really thinking about how the importance of interoperability globally and, and looking for mechanisms to help enable consistency across different national approaches it can help to, to limit fragmentation and international standards is just one of those ways perhaps of doing so. Please. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, I recognize that that it is important to um, um, like to, to recognize there are multiple best practices that that will work. And, uh, but on the other hand, in cyber capacity building, it also helps if there are some best practices that are globally recognized that are scalable. That's because it's efficient. It's an efficient way to to get cyber capacity building done. So it's both ways. You asked uh, for advice to policymakers, and I think the one piece of advice I'd uh, offer is for them to recognize how agile the internet ecosystem is. You know, they, if they make a decision today, by tomorrow morning, industry can be responding with changes to their uh, infrastructure, to their policies, given the way that they have agile development and continuous delivery, continuous integration of their products. I mean, if you just, you know, how many of you on your phone this morning had an update to your app? Uh, that's the pace at, with, at which the, uh, the internet is changing. And, you know, there's no pause. Uh, there's, you know, six months is a really long time. Uh, you know, new product company, you know, venture capitalists are making investments where they want to see a product in, you know, a first, you know, what, minimal viable product within maybe two weeks after they put first money in. So, you know, the pace is uh, something that policymakers really need to appreciate. Uh, and, you know, in security, it's, it's a, a just, as, just as big a challenge. And I think your comment about efficient methodologies, I mean, that's what industry is figuring out, is how to incorporate security efficiently into their methodologies so that they can deliver these products at this pace with security in it. And then I, I think another point it, what I would make is, is to uh, beg policymakers to slow down on occasions because uh, there are a variety of areas right now where policy is being made on, uh, out of, uh, in, a, in a state of panic, all right? Uh, literal panic about filter bubbles, uh, echo chambers, uh, disinformation. And I mean, we uh, certainly, I've, I've done research in seven countries uh, uh, that's fairly uh, robust and uh, I think valid that, that suggests that this is really uh, wildly exaggerated in terms of its impact. And uh, while all these things make sense and you could say, oh yeah, that's disinformation and that's happening, 
uh, what's new about the internet having some misspelled words and wrong information or propaganda on it or any media having this and and the impact of this is really uh, not as great as people uh, believe given journalistic coverage and government panic over this so I'm I would bet anything that we are going to have a raft of legal efforts that are going to be absolutely wrong in terms of content regulation and so forth that are based upon this panic and it's it's just going to be very difficult to claw back from that so it's uh, I don't know how we can it be it seems silly to ask lawmakers to slow down because they usually <laughs> take too long to do anything but but in this kind of environment where everybody's uh, wringing their hands over fake news or whatever uh, it's undoubtedly going to happen and uh, uh, hopefully they'll be they'll look for evidence real evidence of actual impact not the fact that that something exists uh, but that 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 users are uh, uh, seriously affected by any of these things before they uh, make policy that would be against uh, uh, such principles as privacy and freedom of expression and the things that we really, uh, and an open global internet. Okay. Okay, we, we are now coming to the end of the, of the panel. The time is really up. But if you have one final remark, um, please don't hesitate to make it. But otherwise, I heard very interesting suggestion that I think it really is the build up to the way forward in particular in sharing best practices in collaborating much more in trying to to experiment but not too much <laughs> in, in the policy environment and and certainly to educate everyone and and collaborate in a multi-stakeholder approach so involve the whole of the government the whole of the nation the whole of the the citizens as well that and everybody should be speaking and advising um, how to best approach uh, cybersecurity. Um, so if, unless there are final burning uh, comments, I would then uh, thank you very much um, for this very interesting discussion. And, uh, and thank you everybody for being here and contributing to the, to the debate. <laughs>